Hello and welcome to lesson one of the advanced music theory course on fundamental harmony. In this lesson I want to look at some of the basics of fundamental harmony so I'm going to be looking at keys, scales and intervals. Um, probably the most frequent thing that music students tell me that they're worried about when they first learn music theory is trying to remember all the different key signatures and scales that they need to know. Um, but they're actually quite easy to understand if you memorize some very simple tips, uh, tricks and rules. Um, if you find keys, scales and intervals hard to learn, I hope that by the end of this lesson you will never have to worry about them ever again. Um, these rules, tips and tricks that I will show you now will help you find the accidentals to all the major and minor scales, all the major and minor key signatures and how to calculate any interval between any two notes and it's not actually that hard. So the first thing that I would like to look at is the sharp rule. This rule will help you find the accidentals to any major key that uses sharps. Okay, so it'll, it'll help you find the accidentals to all the scales and key signatures that use sharps. And this is what the sharp rule looks like. Father Christmas gave Dad an electric blanket. Now obviously you can put in any sentence or words in here which makes better sense or is easy to remember for you. It's just, just as long as they use those letters in that order F, C, G, D, A, E and B. Okay, That's really the sharp rule. But I'm just using the, the words just to remember the F, C, G, D, A, E and B. Okay. So anything you can think of to go in there um, will help you find all the accidentals to major keys and major scales that use sharps. So how do we use the sharp rule? Well, say we're using the sharp rule without a key signature. In other words, say you're asked to find the key signature to E major or B major or C sharp major or G major, whatever it is, any major scale or key that uses sharps. The way to use the sharp rule without a key signature is to count one letter back in the musical alphabet to find the last sharp of that key signature. So let's take an example of that. Say for example you're looking for the key signature of B major. Okay, Count one letter back from B and you get A and that's the last sharp in the key of B major. So B major has all the sharps in the sharp rule up to and including A sharp and that's five sharps in total. F, C, G, D and A. Okay, five sharps in the scale of B major. Let's take another example. Say for example you're looking for the key signature of D major. Count one letter back from D and you get C. So C is the last sharp this time in the key of D major. So D major has all the sharps in the sharp rule up to and including that C sharp and this time it's only two sharps, F and C sharp. Okay, so it works for all those keys that use sharps, all those keys and scales that use sharps. So if you're looking for the key signature of G major, count one letter back from G and you get F. So G major has all the sharps up to and including F, and that's just the first one, F sharp. If you're looking for the key signature of E major, count one letter back from E and you get D. So E major has all the sharps up to and including D, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, and D sharp. And say you want to know what's the uh, key signature of C sharp major. Count one letter back from C and you get B. So C sharp major has all the sharps up to and including B. And that's basically every sharp in the sharp rule. F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, D sharp, A sharp, E sharp, and finally B sharp. Okay, so that's the sharp rule and how you use it if you don't have a key signature. If you're asked what is the key signature of E major, okay? In other words, you start off knowing what the key is. You know that you're in the key of D major or B major or E major. You just you're just looking for what accidentals or what um, sharps are in those key signatures. But say you do have a key signature, and you need to use that sharp rule, okay? The sharp rule, Father Christmas gave Dad an electric blanket, also gives you the order the sharps are written on staves. 
Okay, and you can see this example here. I've written all the sharps down for the treble clef and all the sharps for the bass clef. And you can see that F is the first sharp in each clef, followed by C, then G, then D, A, and E, and B. Okay, so not only does the sharp rule give you the accidentals for all the major keys that use sharps, it also tells you in what order those sharps are written in the key signature. So you say you want to use the sharp rule and you have the key signature. This time you don't know what key you're in, but you do have a key signature. So how do you use that? Well, find the last sharp in that key signature and count one letter forward this time in the musical alphabet. So the last time we were counting a letter back when we had the key and we're looking for the key signature. This time you have the key signature and you're looking for the key. So it's just the opposite, the complete opposite of the last rule. This time you find the last sharp in the key signature and count one letter forward in the musical alphabet and that will get you the major key. Let's have a look at an example of that. Okay, so you have a key signature with four sharps, F, C, G and D. Find the last sharp which is D and count one letter forward from that and you get E. So this could be the key signature of E major, those four sharps. I say it could be the key signature of E major because you've got to remember the key signatures can signify either a major or a minor key so you won't know that until you see the music um, following after the key signature and time signature so it could be E major but it could be its relative minor and we'll look at the minor keys and scales later but just for now if you just remember how to use um, the sharp rule when you have a key signature you just find the last sharp and count the letter forward if you don't have the key signature if you don't have this information that you see, that you can see on this slide then you've got to count the letter back in the musical alphabet now what do we do if we're looking for the major keys and scales that use flats well there's a different rule that we need to know for that the flat rule. So the flat rule is a little bit similar as you can see to the sharp rule. The sharp rule was Father Christmas gave Dad an electric blanket. The flat rule is that rule in reverse it's, and I've written blanket explodes and Dad gets cold feet. But the rule is really just that B, E, A, D, G, C and F. Okay and that's the sharp rule in reverse. Okay, So the flat rule is just the sharp rule in reverse basically. And again, you can put any words or a sentence in there that is easy to remember for you. And again, as I said, some of my students are um, have a different rule that they use for this. Um, birds eat and down goes cat fast or something like that. Anything at all that you can think of. Just as long as it, as it uses those um, words or those letters in that particular order. So how do we use the flat rule? And again, let's look at it without a key signature. Well, find the tonic that you're, you're starting with in the flat rule and count one word forward in the flat rule and that will get you the last flat of the key signature. Okay, so let's have a look at an example of that just to clarify that. So say you're looking for the key signature of E flat major. Find where E flat major is in the rule Okay, count one word forward from E in the rule and you get A. So blanket explodes and. So that A is the last flat. So E flat major has all the flats in the flat rule up to and including that A. And that's three flats in total. B, E and A. Blanket explodes and. Okay, let's look at another example. Say you're looking for the key signature of G flat major. Find where the G is in the rule, find where the tonic is in the rule, in other words. Count one, for, one word forward from that G and you get C. And that C is the last flat in the key signature of G flat major. So G flat, G flat major has all the flats in the flat rule up to and including C flat. And that's six flats in total. B, E, A, D, G and C flat. Okay, that's blanket explodes and dad gets cold. Okay. So that's how you use the flat rule when you don't have a key signature. Okay, so you can see that it's very different to the sharp rule. In the sharp rule, you are counting back a letter in the musical alphabet. 
this time you're counting forward a word in the flat rule. Okay, so they're not um, complete opposites of each other. Okay, they're not really um, related. Um, so the sharp rule, you count back a letter in the musical alphabet, and in the flat flat rule, you're counting forward a word in the flat rule itself. Um, so what do we do when we're looking for uh, the key itself? We have a key signature, but we're looking for the key. So again, the flat rule, blanket explodes and dad gets cold feet. Just like the sharp rule, it will give you the order. The flats are written on the staves. And again, I've just given you the treble and bass clef, the two most common clefs we use in music. And uh, you can see that B flat will always come first, followed by E, then A, then D, then G, then C, then F. Okay, so that's the way you will always write um, flat key signatures in that particular order. So how do we use the flat rule with a key signature? So this time you find the last flat in the key signature and count one flat back in the key signature and that'll get you the major key. So again, just like the sharp rule has two ways of looking at it with or without a key signature and they're complete opposites of each other, the flat rule also has two ways of using it and again, they're complete opposites of each other. This time we have a key signature and it's just the opposite of what we did in the last slide without a key signature. Okay, so just do the exact same thing except back to front. So this time um, you have a key signature of four flats and you want to know what key that could signify. Find the last flat, okay, and count one flat back. Okay, so the last flat in that key signature is D flat. Count a flat back from that and you get A flat. So this could be the key signature of A flat major. And again, I say it could be the key signature of A flat major because it could also be the relative minor. And again, we won't know that until you see the music that comes after the key signature and the time signature. Okay, and we'll look at uh, minor keys in a minute. But you really do need to know how to use um, these two rules first, the flat rule and the sharp rule. And once you understand how to use those two rules, literally back to front, um, then you can move on to the minor um, scales and keys. So the flat and the sharp rule will give us the key signature or the accidentals to every single major scale or major key that we use in music. But what happens if we're looking for the minors, okay? The relative minors of those major keys. As I said before briefly, a key signature is shared by a major key and a minor key. They are described as relative to each other. Okay, so um, every time you, uh, you see a key signature in a piece of music at the start, whether it's flats or sharps, it could signify a major or a minor key. Okay, so how do we how do we find out if it's major or minor, and how do we find the key signatures and accidentals to all the minor keys? Well, to find the relative minor, you simply count down three semitones, or in America that would be three half steps, from the major key, and you will find its relative minor, and that shares the same key signature. Okay, so you, to find the relative minor count down three semitones or three half steps from the major key and you will find its relative minor. Say you're starting off in a minor and you want to find its relative major, well you just do the complete opposite, you just go up three semitones to, from the minor key and you will find its relative major. And again they both share the same key signature regardless of which direction you're going. Okay, so let's have a look at a piano just to, just to get a visual of that, just to see. Um, say for example we're in the key of A major, I've circled it in blue here and you want to know the three sharps that you see at the beginning of a, a piece in A major, an F sharp, a C sharp and a G sharp. You want to know is the piece in A major or is it in its relative minor. So you have to figure out what its relative minor is. You go down three semitones from A and you will hit F sharp. Okay, and Those green arrows can show you that you move down from A down to G sharp, from G sharp down to G, and then from G down to F sharp. Notice that it's not G flat. I wonder if you can figure out why. Why do you think A major's relative minor is not G flat minor? 
you know, if you if you think it think of it in terms of the key signature of A major uses sharps, it wouldn't make sense that its relative minor is a flat key. Its relative minor has to be a sharp key as well because they're going to be sharing the same key signature. Okay, so you can't have the relative minor of A major to be G flat minor. It wouldn't make sense. Okay, so that's how you basically you find the relative minor. Or if you want to find the relative major, you go up three semitones from F sharp to A. Either direction, doesn't matter. So you're looking for the relative minors or the relative majors. You go up and down three semitones or three half steps. So let's look at an example of using the sharp and flat rule and then finding our relative minor. Okay, so here are four key signatures. I've put them all in the treble clef just to make it easier to read, but they could be in the bass clef or any other clef, I suppose. Um, the first two key signatures use sharps and the second two use flats. So we're going to be using our sharp rule, obviously, for the first two and our flat rule for the second two. So our first key signature has an F sharp, a C sharp, a G sharp, and a D sharp, four sharps. Okay. And our sharp rule is Father Christmas gave Dad an electric blanket. So if you remember how to use the sharp rule when you have a key signature, it's find the last sharp. And in this case, it's D sharp. And then count the letter forward from D and you get E. So this key signature could be E major. Or it could be its relative minor if you count down three semitones from E. And you'll get C sharp minor. So that very first key signature can be E major or C sharp minor. Let's have a look at the second one. Again, we have sharps. Um, Father Christmas gave Dad an electric. Okay, so it only goes as far as E. Okay, it doesn't go the whole way. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six sharps. And how do we use the sharp rule? Well, we find the last sharp and count forward a letter. Okay, and the last sharp is E sharp. Count forward a letter from E and you'll get F. Now it's not F major, it's F sharp major. Okay, because we already have an F sharp as our very first sharp. So F major can't have an F sharp in it, it doesn't make sense. So count the letter forward from E and you'll get F sharp. Okay, and then count three semitones down from F sharp to find the relative minor, and that's D sharp. So the second key signature can be F sharp major or D sharp minor. Okay, so that's just a couple of examples of how to use the um, the sharp rule. As you can see, it gets a little bit more complicated when you have quite a few sharps um, in F sharp major. There, for example, if you count forward a letter from E, it's not going to it's going to land on F, but it's not going to be F major that you're dealing with because you've already sharpened the F. As their very first sharp so it has to be F sharp major and then you count down three semitones from F sharp and you'll get D sharp minor again it's not going to be E flat minor okay because F sharp major and its relative minor have to share the same key signature so it wouldn't make sense to say that E flat minor is the relative minor of F sharp major it's going to be D sharp minor let's look at the flats so in the flats we have very, um, for our first example, in the flats we have a B flat, an E flat, an A flat, and a D flat. Okay, so we have four flats. And if we remember how to use the flat rule, it's different from the sharp rule. You find the last flat, but instead of counting back a letter or forward a letter, you count back a flat. Okay, in the flat in the key signature itself or in the flat rule itself. So we have blanket explodes and dad. Okay. Count back a flat from D and you'll get to A. Okay, so A is the one that comes before that last flat. Uh, so that key signature could be A flat major. Or if you count down three semitones, it's relative minor, F minor. Okay. And for our very last key signature, we've got five flats. We have B, E, A, D, and G. So blanket explodes and dad gets okay find the last flat as before and then count back a flat from it and we get d flat so the last flat is g flat count back a flat from g flat and you'll get 
D flat. So that key signature could be D flat major or its relative minor, if you count down three semitones, B flat minor. And again, notice it's not A sharp minor, it has to be B flat minor because your first key signature, your major key signature, is D flat major. Okay. And I suppose the, the other thing that most people will ask is, well, how do you know when to use the sharp and flat rule? Um, how do you know what keys use the sharp rule and what keys use the flat rule? Well, most of the keys that use the flat rule tend to have flat in the name. All the major ones at any rate. A flat major, B flat major, E flat major, D flat major, G flat major, C flat major. There's only one, in fact, in the whole of um, the, the flat rule that doesn't have flat in the name and that's F major. F major is the only major key that doesn't that has flats in its key signature but doesn't have a flat in the name itself. All the other flat keys will have a flat in the name so they'll let you know that you're using the flat rule. It's very easy that, to know that A flat major uses the flat rule okay whereas A major uses a sharp rule okay and D flat major uses the flat rule but D major uses the sharp rule okay um so you got to remember that f major uses the flat rule even though it doesn't have a flat in the name it's the wee tricky one you have to remember so you should now understand how to use the flat rule and the sharp rule to find all the major key signatures that we have in music okay all the major keys that use sharps and all the major keys that use flats and also if you count down three semitones or three half steps from any of those major keys you'll find the relative minor so it'll also get you all the um, relative minor key signatures as well okay so if you're looking at a key signature from now on I would work out what the major key is first by using your sharp rule or your flat rule depending on what the key signature is of course and then count down three semitones to find the relative minor Okay, so work out the major first and then count down three semitones to find the relative minor. Now I want to look at scales and in particular I want to look at harmonic and melodic minor scales. Before we do that though we need to understand a wee bit about scale degrees, it's quite easy, but it will just help us to understand harmonic and melodic minor scales uh, a little bit better if we understand scale degrees first. So, each note in any scale um, is a degree. Degrees can be described using the numeric scale degree notation to reflect their positions in the scale. Okay, so scaled, um, numeric scale, scale degree note, de notation is just used to reflect the position of notes in a scale. So for example here is a scale of C major and there is the numeric scale degree notation underneath. It's just uh, one with that little symbol above it, and same with two and three and four, five, six, seven, and eight. So you can see that D is the second degree in the scale of C major, and that would be the um, notation we would use to signify that. Um, and also that three with the symbol above it, that signifies that E is the third degree in the scale of C major, and that is the notation we would use to signify that. But each degree in any scale also has a special name to reflect its importance and function within the scale. Okay, so there's another set of um, names that we use for each of these degrees of the scale. The first one we would use is the tonic. Okay, that's probably the most popular one. Okay, and that signifies the key that we're actually in. Okay, so tonic is probably the most um, common a uh, special name that we would use when talking about degrees of a scale. Supertonic, super just meaning above, think of superman, above man, supertonic, above the tonic, so the second degree of the scale is called the supertonic. Mediant, um, I'll come back to that in a second, how I remember what the mediant is, it's always the third degree of the scale but I'll come back to it as a wee way of remembering that. Subdominant, um, again that's probably one of the most important ones. Um, subdominant is the fourth degree of the scale. Dominant is another very important one we need to remember. The dominant is the fifth degree of the scale. Submediant is the sixth degree of the scale, it's quite important as well. Leading note is the seventh degree of the scale and then we're back to C again which is the tonic. 
Okay, so there you can see all the um, names that we use to reflect the importance and function within the scale. Okay, supertonic is above the tonic, median is in the middle between the tonic and the dominant. Okay, the submedian is in the middle between the tonic and the subdominant, and the leading note will always lead up to the tonic. Okay, that's probably why it's called the leading note. That B, seventh degree of the scale, tends to 99 times out of 100 anyway, tends to resolve upwards to the tonic. The ear will always hear that note wanting to be pulled upwards to the tonic. It always wants to lead up to the tonic. That's why it's called the leading note. The dominant is quite an important one as well, the fifth degree of the scale. As we're, when we come to cadences and things like that, you'll find out and chords as well. You'll find that the dominant is very important. Um, it's probably one the second most important note in the scale. So now that you know um, the different names that we give, give to each degree of the scale, we can use this information to help us better understand harmonic and melodic minor scales. So for the harmonic minor scale, it's the same ascending and descending and has a raised leading note. Okay, so in other words, it has a raised seventh degree. For example, the a harmonic minor scale has a G sharp, a raised seventh note going up and down. And just to show you what that would look like, here is your A harmonic minor scale going up from A to A, and it's got a G sharp as the raised seventh degree of the scale going up and when it's going down. When it's ascending, it's raised, and when it's descending, it's raised as well. There are no other accidentals that we need to worry about in the scale of A harmonic minor because if we count up three semitones or three half steps from A minor to find its relative major, we will find that A minor's relative major is C major and C major doesn't have any other sharps or flats. Okay, So C major is the only key that doesn't have any sharps or flats. The key signature is completely blank. So the only accidental we have to add in in A minor is G sharp, okay? Because A minor will share the exact same key signature as C major, and C major doesn't have anything, then A minor doesn't have anything. So A minor key signature doesn't have any other sharps or flats. So the only thing you've got to worry about is if you're using the harmonic minor scale, you raise the seventh degree of that scale, okay? So that G is raised up to a G sharp when you're ascending and descending. Okay, so there's the two G sharps. So what about the melodic minor scale? Well, it has a raised submedian and a raised leading note when ascending. Okay, so it has a raised sixth degree and a raised seventh degree when it's going up. But those two raised notes just return to normal when descending. So a normal submedian and leading note when descending. Let's again take the scale of A melodic minor. I keep using A minor for this slide because I don't want to try and introduce other accidentals um, that you would get in other um, harmonic and melodic minor scales. Okay, I'm using A minor because its relative major is C major and C major doesn't have any other um, sharps or flats to worry about. So the only thing we've got to worry about um, here is the notes that we have to raise according to melodic minor or harmonic minor. There is the scale of A melodic minor ascending. You can see the sixth and the seventh degrees are both raised going up. They both become sharp. But when you're descending, they both return to normal. Okay. In other words, they both go back to a G natural and an F natural. So why do we have this, these two variants of the minor scale? Why are there two different types? Well, I suppose if you look at uh, the harmonic minor, it creates an augmented second interval between the sixth and seventh degrees. If you don't understand what an augmented second interval is, we're going to be looking at that later on in this lesson, intervals, but it's just, it's just in case anyone's wondering why do we have two different types of scale. It's because of that augmented second interval between the sixth and seventh degrees in the harmonic minor scale. In other words, the distance between in the harmonic minor scale, the distance between that F and the G sharp that I've circled in red, that's an augmented second, and that was very difficult for, to sing. Okay, so historically, composers have avoided that because singers found it difficult um, in the Renaissance and medieval and Baroque period. 
So because of that, um, there, they, there was another skill that was created, the melodic minor scale, and that eliminates the augmented second. Okay, so it eliminates that augmented second by raising the sixth degree of the scale as well. So you can see that F sharp to G sharp is now a different interval. That augmented second is gone. And then those two notes return to normal when descending. So the melodic minor scale is just there to get rid of that augmented second interval, just to make it easier for singers to sing. Hence the reason why it's called the melodic minor scale. Okay, it's for it makes it easier for singers. Historically, it was easier for singers to sing that. Whereas the harmonic minor scale it tends to be used for the harmony because you know a keyboard or a continual player didn't have to worry about um that awkward augmented second interval. They, they always find it easy to play anyway. So it was really for the benefit of singers, just in case anyone's wondering. And now we come to the final uh, topic I want to cover in this lesson, intervals. You really need to understand the sharp rule and the flat rule, all your major keys and scales and everything before moving on to intervals. I'm assuming at this stage that you're, you're very confident with understanding all the flat key signatures, all the sharp key signatures, how to use your flat and sharp rule back to front, how to find your relative minors or your relative majors going up and down three semitones and so on. So I'm assuming at this stage that you're able to under you understand that pretty well before moving on to intervals because intervals um, you really need to understand everything about keys and scales and then when you're moving on to chords you need to understand everything about intervals and then once you understand everything about key scales intervals and chords then we can really get start getting into the fundamental harmony part of this course about chord progressions and voice leading and that sort of thing so every single lesson obviously is going to be built on everything that we've done before so at this stage i would ask um if you not entirely confident about major keys or major scales please go back and um, look over this video and try some of the exercises that are on the website and if you have any difficulties please get in contact with, contact with me hopefully that goes without saying I know most of my students at this point will just email me or drop in at any stage it's no problem um, so please let me know if you have any difficulties with anything at, um, at this stage so with that all out of the way let's move on to intervals so what are intervals basically? We'll look at that first. Um, the distance between any two notes is called an interval. So I suppose interval is just a fancy way of saying distance. Okay, so it's just the distance between two notes. If the two notes are played together, they form a harmonic interval. So already you can see the very, very basics of fundamental harmony here, and that we are the most simple type of harmony you can have is a harmonic interval, two notes that are played at the same time and the interval would be the distance between those two notes. Here you can see I've got a mid middle C and the C above it so the distance between those two notes would be an octave that's your interval, the uh, octave. Um, also you can have a, if a melodic interval if one note comes after the other okay so again same two notes the C and the, C, the middle C and the C above it it's still the distance of an octave but now it's a, just a melodic interval I suppose it's just a bit more bit more accurate way of describing the interval okay so it's still a distance of an octave but it's a melodic um, interval this time okay so that's all that intervals are um, they are just the distance between two notes and they can be a harmonic interval or a melodic interval depending on the music you have in front of you most important things to remember about intervals so have your notepads ready to take this down um, when working out the distance of any interval, both notes are always counted. That's a very important thing to remember. Okay, Both notes are always counted. That's the number one thing. Second thing, intervals are always calculated from the bottom note first. Okay, Even if the top note comes first. Okay, So if you look back um, above the, so the melodic interval part of this slide, if you look at the second example of melodic intervals there, you can see that the high C comes first and then it's followed by the middle C underneath it. If you wanted to work out the interval, you'd still work it out from the bottom C, that middle C first, even though the top note is played first. So you always calculate intervals from the bottom note upwards. Okay, so, and that's actually going to be a very important principle for 
for working out uh, voice leading and chords and inversions and things like that the bottom note is going to be very important in this course okay so anyone who plays bass will be happy to know that the melody actually isn't as important now when we're dealing with harmony okay so the bass note is probably the, the most important note that w we use for fundamental harmony especially the theory side of it anyway so remember that intervals are always calculated from the bottom note upwards okay even if the top note comes first and the last thing to rem remember about intervals I suppose we've already just mentioned it harmonic intervals are the simplest type of harmony so intervals are the basis for all harmony and we're going to look at that in the next class or in the next lesson when we deal with triads okay so those are the three things to remember about um, intervals two different types of intervals as well and the three things you need to remember about intervals always count from the bottom note up always include the bottom note and the top note in your calculation and remember that harmonic intervals are the simplest type of harmony and intervals are the basis for all harmony okay which which you'll see in the next class so how do we calculate intervals well say we're looking for the distance between that C and the G so what do we do? Well, as I said, the very first rule um, is you start at the bottom note and count up. So that's the very first thing you do is you start in that C and you count the distance upwards. So count all the notes from the top note to the, or from the bottom note, sorry, to the top note and include the bottom note and the top note in your calculation. So C would be one, D is two, E would be three, F is four, and G, which is the top note as you can see, that would be a five okay so you know it's a fifth of some description you know the distance between that C and the G is a fifth okay that's our first two steps now this is where you really do need to know your major scales as I said before you need to know your major scales uh, flats and sharps everything that we've already said in this lesson you need to know it back to front because this is where this information comes in handy now treat the bottom note as the first note of a major scale Okay, now it's pretty easy in this example, but imagine if the bottom note was C sharp, you would need to know your C sharp major scale. In this case, it's just C. Okay, so you just need to know your C major scale, which has no sharps or flats, so it's pretty easy. But remember that that bottom note could be anything. It could be a, a flat, could be um, F sharp, could be G flat or D sharp, could be anything. Okay, so you need to know your major scales pretty well to get to understand this part. So treat the bottom note as the first note of a major scale. If the top note is in that scale, then we call the intervals by the following names. Okay, so a major second between C and D, a major third between C and D, a perfect fourth between C and F, a perfect fifth between C and G, a major sixth between C and A, a major seventh between C and B, and a perfect octave between C and C. So you can see that there's it's not they're not all given the same names. You have major seconds, thirds, sixths, and sevenths, but you have perfect fourths, fifths, and eighths. Okay. I suppose the reason behind the, uh, the way that I remember it is that your fourth and your fifth and your octave, if you're if you were ever to play them on the piano, you could you would be able to hear quite quickly that they're very strong intervals they're very they're probably the intervals we would use quite frequently to make up chords okay so they're given a special meaning as opposed to a special name so your seconds your thirds your sixth and your sevenths are always going to be major um or they're never going to be perfect okay there's no such thing as a perfect third or a perfect second or a perfect sixth likewise there's no such thing as a major fourth or a major fifth okay so try and remember, memorize those um, descriptions for seconds, thirds, sixths, and sevenths, and the different descriptions for fourths, fifths, and eighths. Okay. So as you can see, just from looking at that, um, you can see that that our very first interval we were looking for, C to G, you can see that's going to be a perfect fifth. Okay. So you knew that it was a fifth before. From the at, by the second bullet, by the second point, you should have known that it was a fifth because you've counted up C one, D two, E three, F four, G five, but you have to know what type of fifth it is. 
The only way you're going to know that is by treating the bottom note as the first note of a major scale and then work out does the top note belong to that scale and if it does you use these names underneath okay that I've written down there underneath each interval. What happens though if the top note is not part of the bottom notes major scale? Okay, so if the top note is not part of the bottom notes major scale, then follow these rules. Okay, if it was a major interval and you've raised it by a semitone, it's going to semitone higher, then it becomes augmented. Okay, if it was a major second, third, sixth, and seventh, and you've made it a semitone lower, it becomes a minor second, third, sixth, or seventh. If it was a perfect four, fifth, or eighth, and you've made it a semitone higher, again, it becomes augmented. But if you've made it a semitone lower, if you made a perfect four, fifth, or octave a semitone lower, it becomes diminished. Okay. So just bear in mind that there's a difference there between minor and diminished. And also, if you've made a minor interval a semitone lower again, you've even gone further down from a minor, it eventually gets to diminished as well. So if you think of augmented at the top, major underneath or perfect underneath, and then minor or diminished underneath each of them. Okay, so if you remember this table, this middle section of this slide, this will help you work out all the different intervals, all the different distances between any two notes um, anywhere in music, basically. So let's have a look at an example. Here you can see we've got the distance between A and C. Okay, so you start from the bottom note up that's the first thing we always do every note is included in your calculation in between so a would be one b would be two and c would be three so you know that the distance between those two notes is a third of some description you don't know what type of third yet because you have to work out does the top note belong to the bottom notes major scale okay so this, again this is where you need to know your scales off by heart that we can just um call them to memory immediately. So is it is the top note part of the bottom notes major scale? Well the bottom note is A. Okay, so we have to pretend that you're in A major to work out this interval. And is C part of the A major scale? No it's not. C is usually sharpened in A major. If you work out what A major has, it usually has three sharps in its key signature or its scale. It has F sharp, C sharp, and G sharp. Okay, But here we've just got a C natural. We don't have a C sharp. So we had taken, if I had been a C sharp, it would have been a major third. But we've taken what would have been a major third and made it lower by a semitone. We've reduced that. Okay, That major third is now a minor third. Okay, so... That is described as a minor third, that interval, because the C should have been sharpened to belong to the bottom notes major scale, but we haven't sharpened it. We've made it a semitone lower. We've made it C natural. So that makes that interval a minor third. Just by using this table, you can see a, a semitone lower underneath a major becomes minor. What about this interval, F to B? Again, start at the bottom note. Count all the notes from the bottom note to the top note and include both those notes in your calculation. So F is 1, G would be 2, A would be 3, and B would be 4. So you know that the distance between F and B is a fourth of some description. Now you've got to ask yourself, does the top note belong to the bottom note's major scale? And again, you need to know your, your major scales off by heart. Um, so the bottom note is F, so you need to know that F major usually has a B flat in its key signature and in its scale. So here we've got a B natural. So we've actually made it that distance bigger by a semitone. If it had have been F to B flat, it would have been a perfect fourth, but it's F to B natural. So it's a semitone larger. So now it's an augmented fourth. Okay. And finally, we have a B to an F this time. Okay, so again, start at your bottom note, B. Um, count all the notes from the bottom note to the top note, including the two notes in your calculation. So B is 1, C is 2, D is 3, E is 4, and F is 5. So you should know that it's a fifth of some description. You don't know what type of fifth yet because 
you have to work out does the top note belong to the bottom notes major scale and the bottom note is B so you have to work out what is the major scale of B major well B major usually has five sharps F sharp C sharp G sharp D sharp and A sharp so that F would normally be sharpened in the bottom notes major scale if it had been sharpened it would have been a perfect fifth okay but you've made it a semitone lower so it becomes a diminished fifth it's not F to B or it's not B to F sharp it's just B to ordinary F so it's a diminished fifth also notice that when we um, usually when we are writing uh, intervals in shorthand we capital M for major capital P for perfect capital A for augmented and lowercase for minor a lowercase m for minor and a lowercase d for diminished okay that's just that's just a convention there's no real hard and fast rule to remember that. It's just something you'll get used to writing rather than having to write out as you can see minor third augmented fourth diminished fifth you can see the shorthand in brackets after each of those it's much quicker and easier to do okay so hopefully that makes a bit of sense this is the point five of how to, how to calculate intervals and you only you have to use this if the top note doesn't belong to the bottom notes major scale if you're unlucky enough to hit that, to get to that stage so in the previous slide the first four points are um, probably what you're going to use more often than not um, so number one is start from the bottom note uh, number two would be Count all the notes from the bottom note to the top note, including the two notes that are you're using in your calculation. Number three then is treat the bottom note as the first note of the major scale. So for each of these three examples in the slide, I was pretending I was in A major, F major, and B major. Okay, and then you've got to ask yourself, number four, does the does the top note belong to the bottom note's major scale? And if it does, you call it a major second, a major third. A perfect fourth, perfect fifth, major sixth, major seventh, and perfect octave. If the top note doesn't belong to the bottom note's major scale, then you have to use this slide, this this rule. Um, a major interval made a semitone higher is augmented. A perfect interval made a semitone higher is augmented. But a major interval made a semitone lower is minor, and a perfect interval made a semitone lower is diminished. Okay. So it'll probably take a wee bit of time. It might take um a week or so just to just to let this digest. And I, but again, if you have any problems with it, please let me know, and we can arrange to meet up. Okay, so that's how to calculate intervals. But what about intervals that are more than just an octave? Okay, we got as far as a perfect octave. What happens if you have an interval which is over an octave? Well, they're called compound intervals. Okay, so far all the intervals we've discussed have been simple intervals less than an octave wide. If the interval is greater than an octave, it is called a compound interval. There are other words we can use, and I'll show you them in a second. But I prefer if I would prefer it if all of you would use compound intervals when um, doing your assignments or homeworks. Okay, because it it makes it easier, I think. So compound intervals are formed by the combination of a perfect octave plus um, another interval or the other interval. So you can see here that we've got a C to an E as our first interval and our second interval is C to an E but the E is more than an octave away. Okay. So again going through all the steps that we did before start at the bottom note, count from the bottom note to the top note including the two notes in your calculation. Okay. So it's C is 1, D is 2, E is 3 you know it's a third of some description. And then ask yourself, does the top note belong to the bottom note's major scale? And it does, because C major doesn't have any sharps or flats, so E is normally E natural in the key of C major. So that's called a major third. Okay, so what happens if it's an octave higher? Well, you could call it a compound major third. Okay, so or compound capital M3 for shorthand. Okay. And you work that out by counting up your octave first and then pretend from that octave C to the next note that you're using is their interval. <laughs> okay, so the compound takes you as far as the octave and then the major third part of it takes you from where that C would be an octave higher to the highest note that you're working out. Um, it can also be described as a major tenth. 
Okay, this is where I wouldn't recommend you guys doing this major tenths and elevenths and twelfths and thirteenths and everything like that because it, it tends to get a little bit complicated. If you just remember um, your major seconds, thirds, sixths and sevenths, your perfect fourths, fifths and octaves and then just add the word compound before each interval if it's more than an octave. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense about working at compound intervals. So that's basically it guys for um, lesson one. Um, I know there's quite a bit in that lesson uh, that we were looking at so give yourself plenty of time to look over the material, the handouts, do a couple of the exercises if you have time. Um, feel free to get in contact with me if you have any questions or queries or need a bit of extra help. Um, it will take a bit of time to get to know these things but trust me when you've read over it, do a couple of exercises and study it and make your own revision notes, it should all sink in pretty um, pretty quickly and also it'll be of great help no matter what style of music you're doing whether it's trad or classical or jazz or or pop music anything at all um, knowing uh, all about keys and scales and intervals um, is really helpful okay it should help you with your compositions as well but if you have any any um, queries or if you need any help um, or if there's something that you're just unsure of and don't want to ask me in class that's fine you can always just email me or um, get in contact with me through the website. So I hope this has been of some help or some use to you.